Welcome back to the Savant Report podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Weirs, and today we have a very special guest with us, Natalie Brunel. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm I'm really, really excited to have you. Um, I have to tell you, you're my first female guest ever, which is amazing, oh. and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, awesome. And I really want to introduce you to my audience because you uh, you are such a prolific uh, person in the Bitcoin community. So uh, uh -huh. if I may, can I just ask you to introduce yourself and how you got into Bitcoin? Sure. Well, that's very kind of you to say. My name is Natalie Brunel. I host a podcast that's mainly focused on Bitcoin and economics called Coin Stories, where I talk to a lot of prominent Bitcoin names about their origin stories and why they have so much conviction and their reactions to the latest headlines. I also do frequent media commentary because I used to be a broadcast journalist. So I go on the news to talk about Bitcoin and I have the opportunity to travel the world and educate people on Bitcoin, which I'm so grateful for. So that's a little bit about what I do. Well, I'll tell you what, your story is really interesting to me because you actually quit your job or your career as a traditional journalist to focus solely on Bitcoin. How did that come about? And that, like, that's such an amazing <laughs> commitment to make. Yeah, you know, I really believe uh, that Bitcoin can fix a lot of the problems that exist in our financial system. And what I think is really sad um, is that we don't have great financial literacy in this country. And so I went to good schools and I was a really, really hardworking student, but I really never learned what money printing is or the fact that other economic theories exist that maybe don't believe in inflation or going so far into debt. And Bitcoin was really what sparked that knowledge journey for me. So I learned about Bitcoin in 2017 while I was a reporter. I got further and further down the rabbit hole and decided as a hobby to start a podcast just because I was so passionate about the subject and really exposing um, you know, some of the problems in our current financial system that have even affected my own family. And the further I, I got and the more that I did the show, I realized that I, I want to branch off and actually make this my career if I can and take a big leap. I didn't know what was going to happen. It's very difficult, obviously, to go out on your own or, or monetize something like a podcast. But luckily, uh, my show found an audience and I, I feel like I'm speaking truth to power. I'm, I'm discussing issues that I always wanted to discuss, but really couldn't as a journalist. I feel like I'm being really authentic uh, to myself. And I, I also feel like journalism has changed a lot. I, I didn't want to be um, working in a corporate environment where I felt like I was kind of going along with a certain narrative or or not really um, educating the public on things that I thought were extremely important. You know, I would I would occasionally get to do a Bitcoin story, but not very frequently. I couldn't really cover things from the angle of what's wrong with our financial system, because to be honest, most of my colleagues didn't understand what was wrong with my with the financial system. So, you know, I just I decided to take a leap. And so far, it's been worth it. Wow. Well, that's uh, that's amazing. And I just want to thank you from the entire Bitcoin community because you do us all such a great service getting education out there. Thank um, you. So I want to dive into some of your journalism because you get to talk to some of the, the greatest minds in Bitcoin and the greatest minds in the industry. And I love watching your podcast because you have amazing guests and they have amazing, incredible depths of knowledge. Um, Michael Saylor is certainly one of them. But I want to ask you, who has been the most influential guest that you've had on your podcast? And what did you learn from that person? That is a really difficult question because I'm so grateful to have had as brilliant a minds as Michael Saylor and Lynn Alden and Preston Pish and Jeff Booth. Um, so honestly, I, I, there are so many that I, I would answer. In particular, just one that comes to mind. Um, I had a fascinating pair of conversations with Jeff Booth, who's the author of one of my favorite books, Price of Tomorrow. He just has such a grasp on the evolution of where society is going, where our financial system is going, where technology is going. And he's such a thoughtful person. I consider him a, a really close friend and a mentor now. And so we did a follow-up conversation recently in Norway, just about the debt crisis, the price of Bitcoin following, falling, um, the, the macro environment that we're in that's creating so much volatility, but also the first time I had him on my show, I got his whole backstory and how, you know, how he rose in his career and how he discovered Bitcoin and how he wrote his book. So, um, I would say that I really admire Jeff and he's probably one of my favorite guests. All right. That's, that's really interesting. And that is a phenomenal book. If, if, uh, any yeah. of my listeners have not read it, it's an absolute must read. Um, so I want to ask you in this current environment, I'm going to guess that you're privy to conversations that are off camera. And um, I, I'm just wondering, are, is anybody nervous 
in the outside of the public eye personas, um, are they nervous about the Bitcoin markets right now? Are they nervous about, you know, macro aside, because I think we're all nervous about the macro, right? But given this massive drawdown, and we all know that Bitcoin has had these big cycles before, are there conversations happening where they're saying, hey, we're a little concerned about um, bad regulation. We're a little concerned about the different countries regulating Bitcoin or coming up with their own Bitcoin narratives and, and regulate, regulatory structure. Or is everybody pretty much status quo? Like, hey, this is what Bitcoin does. And it's just another day in Bitcoin or heaven. You know, everybody that I talk to, especially some of these prominent voices, they are very bullish on the long term and recognize that short term, we might have things that we we can't predict or are a little bit painful, but in the long term, Bitcoin will win and Bitcoin, you know, will probably perform the way that it has for the last 13 years, which is that when you zoom out, it goes up and up and up and it can move up very, very quickly uh, at a moment's notice. So I think the general questions are just, you know, how much pain are we going to suffer in the, in the short term? How, how much lower is the price going? to go. And everybody acknowledges the fact that now as this ecosystem has grown, it also has these, these, these things on the margins, you know, that are the altcoins and the, these third party, um, platforms and exchanges that may have too much leverage, or they may have questionable liquidity. And so those, you know, tend to bring Bitcoin down when they are, are suffering issues. So, um, so that's really the big, the big question that everybody has is just, you know, how much more pain in the system, how much, how much, much is it going to go down before something breaks and the Fed has to pivot? You know, what will happen with some of these exchanges? Will Bitcoin draw down? But again, this is all very short term. And, and yes, bear markets are never fun. At the same time, they're great accumulation or entry points for some people. Um, and in the long term, we all really believe in this and we believe that it's going to continue to go up. And, and we don't believe that 67 or eight or nine K was the top and, and that Bitcoin's dead, even though, you know, 490 articles, I think say that Bitcoin is dead. So um, no, I don't, I don't hear genuine concern from people about long-term investing in Bitcoin. So um, along that note, we are talking about p- potentially things systemically breaking here in the United States. Um, corporate credit seems to be like on the edge of a cliff. Um, watching, of course, the price of Bitcoin, uh, that's correlated really into some systemic issues inside of the cryptocurrency community, right? We've yep. seen uh, Celsius, mm-hmm. Three Arrows Capital. Um, I know that you're a Bitcoin maxi, and, and, I, and I love you for that. I love Bitcoin maxis. Um, but tell me, do you see an ecosystem outside of Bitcoin itself um, you know, I know Jeff Booth is starting his uh, his new Bitcoin centric fund. Max Kaiser mm-hmm. has his Bitcoin centric uh, ecosystem. You know, investment vehicles. Do you see any um, any possibility or probability that blockchain as a uh, as a real force to be reckoned with will be around in ten years, or does it all go away and it's just Bitcoin? You know, I think that there's definitely going to be innovation and growth within sort of the DeFi and crypto space. What what the winners are going to be, what the losers are going to be, I don't know. We definitely are not going to have 20,000 cryptocurrencies like we do today. I'll tell you that. And there are ongoing conversations that are happening right as we speak with the SEC about which ones are commodities, which ones are securities. And I think those definitions are going to be revealed pretty soon. I believe it was Gary Gensler that said very recently that Bitcoin is the only one that for sure is a commodity. And Gary seems to understand Bitcoin very well, given his speeches that he's given on it at at MIT. So um, I do think there's going to be an interesting ecosystem that evolves. But one of the reasons why I focus so much attention on Bitcoin is because, well, A, I think that it really, truly addresses the, the fundamental broken issues in our financial system that have caused so much wealth concentration and put a downward pressure on so much of society where people feel left behind and 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 the the few have so much of the pie and the many have so so little they're fighting over breadcrumbs um, and also because I don't, I don't think that the average person, you know, the plumber, the accountant, the doctor should have to become a day trader on the side just to make a profit. You know, we're all, every, even with crypto, it's like you have to time the market, know when to cash out, you know, someone's left holding the bag. Why does it have to be so hard just to save your money or protect the purchasing power of your money? And none of the other cryptocurrencies really address that fundamental issue. It's just Bitcoin. It's a digital form of hard money that I think could solve a lot of these problems and, and allow for more access to the financial 
system for the average person and allow it to be based on, you know, real value as opposed to who's close to the money printer. So that's why I get so passionate about Bitcoin. I'm a big believer in free markets and there's going to be innovation and there's going to be people creating lots of different projects. And, you know, some will succeed, some will fail in the same way that we had in, I think, the dot-com bubble. So, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do put my faith in, you know, what Bitcoin is going to be in 10, 20 years, as opposed to what some random cryptocurrency is going to be. Do you worry that the cryptocurrency market as a, as a whole, those other, you know, 19,999 <laughs> detract from the value of Bitcoin? I mean, I know that they kind of run in fads and, you know, one coin is really, really hot for a week. And then all the influencers are talking about another one. And th this money just kind of seems to move from one to another. Um, do you fear that that has actually diluted the real true value of Bitcoin? And, sure. and if so, is it a temporary distraction or is it a permanent distraction? Sure. I do think that. I do think it's temporary. And I will say that I think that many of the other cryptocurrencies have benefited from Bitcoin's rise. But unfortunately, Bitcoin has suffered when some of the other cryptocurrencies fail because people are drawing liquidity and, and have to collateralize from every direction. So, you know, I think this is temporary. I think this is the volatility that we have because of the macro factors involved, as well as the fact that it's just a very new, you know, asset class. You know, digital assets are just at the starting point. People, a lot of people don't understand them. Don't don't trust them. So I think a lot of this is going to change in the years ahead. And I think the big people that were early adopters of Bitcoin are going to, to um, benefit from the fact that they were in early and we're still early. You know, people think it's, it's late now, but um, it's funny. I'm reminded of those memes of, you know, the long line to purchase Bitcoin at 69 K the FOMO, and then, you know, no line at 20 K and we're going to see that repeatedly. And we're going to have more cycles, right? We we're crying that Bitcoin went from 60 to 20. What will people be doing when Bitcoin goes from 150 to 70? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love those memes. Um, and it is so true. It is so true that that people are always um, the most bullish at the very, very top, right? And we can sometimes maybe yeah. guess the tops just based on sentiment alone. Um, let's talk about regulation real quick, because you talked about Gary Gensler. We have mm -hmm. a big week next week with the potential grayscale um, ETF getting approved or not. Um, mm -hmm. Curious what your thoughts are about that, if you think that it's going to get approved. Um, and you know, what has Gary Gensler been doing for the last while here, preventing Grayscale from doing it? And then as a side note to that, and I know this is like three questions all in one, so do your best with me. Um, do you worry about bad regulation? I think that there's two different kinds of regu regulation, right? There's that which helps support the ecosystem and helps mm -hmm. support, uh, good practices moving forward and that which could actually hamper it and be a real detractor to the evolution and the adoption of Bitcoin. Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is why I think it's it's so important for policymakers to really have a good understanding of what Bitcoin is so that they don't spread misinformation or false narratives like the ones out there about proof of work mining that a lot of the European legislators are latching on to. Um, but you know, the question of whether the SEC is going to approve Grayscale ETF, I don't know. I think it's ridiculous that we have these short futures ETFs and ones that, you know, I would argue protect investors a little bit less than something like Bitcoin. But this is a very complex topic and layered issue because what I've read about and what I'm trying to learn a little bit more about is the fact that um, one of the issues has been that a lot of these exchanges and a lot of the, the pools of money within this space, within Bitcoin, exist outside of this country. So it's very hard for the SEC to come in and, and regulate and oversee a lot of it because in the case of other commodities and things like gold, um, it's based here in, in the US, Chicago Mer Mercantile Exchange and all of that. So there are some questions. A lot of these exchanges and, um, and, and you know the reserves that they're backed by, they have no control over. They're in foreign countries. So I don't know that they're going to approve it. I think Grayscale has been doing a great job pushing for that. It's trading at such a discount right now. I, I mean, it's drawn down, I think, like 70% from last year's highs. So um, for some people, I think, you know, they've been kind of stocking up on GBTC, thinking that it's going to go up. I would argue that it's got the best shot. Um, I'm curious to see what Gary Gensler is going to do, because, again, I know that he knows his stuff. I know that he understands the, the power and the the really the um the immutability and the 
the immortality of, of Bitcoin, the fact that you can't kill it, a government really can't uh, come in and ban it in the same way that you can't ban the internet. And so I guess to answer both questions, at the end of the day, they can try to regulate it out of existence, but it's really like trying to kill the internet. And you're, gonna, you're going to um, send innovation and competition uh, to other jurisdictions that are more friendly. And so I really hope the US does not do that. And I don't think we're moving in that direction. I think we're actually moving in the right direction with legislators like Cynthia Lummis, who just uh, had that bipartisan bill with Kirsten Gillibrand. And I think that there are so many efforts out there to educate the folks in Washington. There are so many smart people that are saying, hey, whether you're progressive or Republican, this is why Bitcoin is a non-political, a apolitical bipartisan issue. And it's the ability for us to bank the unbanked and for us to have a competitive advantage and you know, reinforce our energy infrastructure, all these amazing things. So I'm very bullish on, on regulation. And I really do want to see the SEC clarify that all these other projects and currencies are securities and have them have the proper disclosures. And, and, uh, and I think that will be a win for Bitcoin as well. I also think we need, you know, a stable coin that people can trust. And so a lot's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely following it closely and I'll be interested to see what happens. That's a really great lead into my very next question, which is, where do you see Bitcoin, you know, two to three years from now? Obviously, we're in the midst of a bear market. Mm -hmm. uh, people are worrying. A lot of people, my heart goes out to them. They got in at 40,000, 50,000, <laughs> 60,000, right? Um, and, and they listen to all the narratives. They listen to, to you. They listen to me. They listen to people who are very, very passionate about Bitcoin and about this ecosystem. And now they're sitting here saying, you know, is this tulip mania 2.0? Um, and what do you say to them, you know, about the next 12, 18, 24 months? Because I think people just generally speaking, have that shorter time horizon bias. And then what do you tell people, you know, the Bitcoin market price wise and the ecosystem is going to look like five to 10 years in the future? Yeah, you know, I, I can't really predict the price because I think that there are so many other factors in play, especially given our inflationary environment and whether it's going to turn into stagflation. I do expect choppiness and volatility for, for the near future. I think we can go lower than we are. I don't think we've hit um, a bottom, but on the, on the bigger picture, I, you know, Bitcoin is a technology network. And so it is actually following the standard S curve adoption that all technologies follow. And it's actually being adopted faster, more rapidly than the internet was in the nineties. And recently I was on, I think, Fox Business News, and I made that comparison. You know, in the 90s, the internet came out and it was gradually then suddenly at first people were like, this isn't, I'm not, it's going to be a fad. It's not going to affect my business. It transformed every single business, the way we communicate, the way we spread information, how we educate ourselves. I mean, the internet literally changed our lives and we are never going back to the way it was. And Bitcoin is doing the same thing on a monetary scale. It's, it's allowing for transactions at lightning speed with instant, you know, near instant settlement between two people and no third parties, no middleman taking a cut. And I think that's revolutionary. And it's, um, I think that in the next five years, I think that adoption will be over. It will surpass a billion people, which is what is predicted that by 2025, we will have 1 billion users on Bitcoin. And it'll follow again, that sort of S curve. More and more people are gonna pile in and finally understand, but that the education component is key. And also I think that people, you know, turn on the news. I, I used to work for the news and I know the headlines, it's, you can't have a lot of hope right now when you turn on the news and, and, and listen to how expensive everything is getting, the real estate market, um, stocks are you know bleeding out while the average person can't even afford you know, necessarily gas or rent, rent going up 40% in some cities. I mean, life is getting harder and harder. And I think people are starting to question, well, why is this? Are, are the narratives that I'm being told by the media or by the government, are they actually real? Um, how can I save my money? How can I protect my money? And I think that more and more people will see that the conclusion, all, you know, the roads lead to Bitcoin as an alternative and as an insurance policy against some of the things that our, our central bankers and, and our politicians have been doing for so long, that now is at a point where the music's still playing, but it has to stop at some point. We're going to fall off the cliff and that could be very, very painful. So um, I, I'm very bullish on the next five to 10 years. I think, you know, you never want to judge something on short-term volatility. If you did that, then every, uh, pretty much every stock or trade probably has a, has something negative you could say about it at any given point. But I think in the long term, more and more people will get onto the Bitcoin standard or at least allocate a 
small portion of what they have to Bitcoin and it'll continue to grow. So how much intellectual honesty, uh, now this is talk about like a really prying question to a journalist, how much intellectual honesty do you think there is about the Bitcoin headlines um, that are out there in the mainstream news? Not, you know, not in our little niche of the world in Bitcoin, but you see the narratives, Elizabeth Warren, you see what just happened in New York trying to ban Bitcoin mining. Um, you know, you hear this uh, narrative that Bitcoin takes more energy, uses more energy than mm -hmm. uh, small countries do. Now, people like you and I who live, eat, breathe, sleep, and love and are very passionate about Bitcoin, we dive into it a little bit more. We understand mm -hmm. the narratives. But the, the, the general consensus across the media is really quite negative on that. Yep. Do you think that it's a very intentional uh, misallocation of truth, <laughs> to put it mildly? Uh, that's a great question. I've, I've definitely thought about this. For the most part, I, I do believe that, especially on an individual basis, that most people are good or trying to do good. There are, there are definitely some people that are just outright corrupt and evil out there, but I truly believe that it's there, there lacks a, um, a level of modesty about what people know and don't know. And people latch on to just assumptions or headlines or, you know, summaries given to them maybe by staff members who are uninformed. And unfortunately that that drives certain narratives that I hope to be able to, to stop or dispel in some way. Because I think that, look, if you really truly understand Bitcoin, I don't see how anyone could be against it. I don't care what your party affiliation is. I don't care what your background is, your monetary level. If you really understand Bitcoin, you should actually be for it. Um, and so the people that I see come out against it and the excuses and reasons that they give tell me that they're not informed, not educated. The only thing that makes me sad is, going back to that level of modesty or intellectual curiosity, there are so many efforts underway, myself included on just like an average, average Joe Twitter level of like, Hey, talk to us, let us teach you, let us inform you. Can you read X, Y, and Z about this? And when, when people kind of shut the door in your face or just, you know, refuse to listen, that gets to be frustrating. That's what I think causes people to question, like, is this a good person that actually wants to help people or, um, but you know, I, I think that again, this will, this will change. There's so much resistance because I think that the FUD, it just captures those, those headlines and those, like it, it, it zings those nerves that are, are exposed for, for all of us when we watch the media. And it's just, it, Bitcoin can take a lot of easy hits if you don't understand it. And it does take a little bit of time, patience, thoughtfulness to, to question the status quo, because it is at the end of the day, Bitcoin really causes you to question the entire system that so many people have benefited from, or that so many people right now are in leadership positions in. And um, I think that's just going to take a little bit more time. So, so has it actually happened to you? I mean, it sounded like you started to articulate it, but have you actually reached out to these people, mm -hmm. you know, in elected office and they just yes. say, Hey, thanks for your offer, but we have yes. no interest in hearing what you have to say. Yes. I have reached out to Senator Warren. I have reached out to AOC. I have reached out to Trump's people. I have reached out. I reach out. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. My, my media background has helped in so many ways because I'm able to communicate and crystallize messages and stories, but at the same time, I also have this like persistence and, and aggressiveness when it comes to, I used to have to knock on doors in tragic situations on people's worst days and ask them to talk to me on camera. You know, it's, you, you, you develop a little bit of like a gusto and, and courage to, to, to just ask. And, and if the answer is no, then, you know, at least I asked. Right. So yeah, I've definitely messaged, tweeted at, um, the folks that I just believe should, should listen for a second and not to make these conclusions without actually understanding the technology and how it would benefit the people that they, they represent. And, um, I'm going to continue to do so. I, I really believe in what sailor has said, in public about how we should be cheerful and constructive. There, there is a way to reach across the table and have a conversation so that there could be a mutual understanding. And I don't know why there's so much resistance to it um, because Bitcoin touches, you know, the, the, the qualities of Bitcoin and what it represents. It touches every aspect of our lives. It really does. And so I had a great time learning about it. And now I love teaching people about it. And I hope that we can teach some of these really powerful, influential people who seem to just have the door shut right now when it comes right. to Bitcoin. You know, it's, it's interesting. So many people come to Bitcoin for so many different reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Some come for um, the intellectual curiosity of the mathematics. They come mm -hmm. for the, the geeky nerd part. They come for the investment part. They come for the human rights part. Um, 
but it sounds to me like you're kind of a mix of all of the above. Mm -hmm. And you see this as an all encompassing new era. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, it sounds to me like you uh, believe that this is a not just a game changer for the monetary system, not just a new technology, but potentially a new beginning. Is that is that accurate? I think that's very fair to say. I have so much hope in Bitcoin and I the older that I get and the more that I think about maybe philosophical things. I think that hope is so essential to the human experience. Uh, I think it pushes us forward. It allows us to cooperate and to, to strive for something better. And when I was a reporter for about 10 years, you know, I, if, as far as my predisposition, I was predisposed, I think, to what Bitcoin represents because my family lost everything in the financial crisis. First generation immigrants, uh, they grew up under communism. So I'm very against that form of government and any direction that we head in, in toward it. Uh, and they worked super, super hard. They wanted an average, you know, working class, middle class life. And within the blink of an eye, they lost everything because of decisions that were not in their, their control. And I just felt like there's something rigged and unfair in the system. So I entered my journalism career sort of with that, that seed planted. And I then witnessed as a reporter, so much of these societal issues unwinding or getting worse, poverty ballooning, homelessness ballooning, more civil unrest, um, crime, uh, every, everything was like increasing, even though every politician that would come in, even on these local levels, local elections that I would cover, oh, I'll, I'm, I'll solve the problem or I'll fix it. I'll spend this amount of money. And then boof, boom, like billions of dollars are spent. And the problem's just bigger a couple of years later. And the politician doesn't get kicked out of office. They just get promoted. And I was like, where are we going here? How do you have hope that it's going to get better when every single year we hear false promises, we have false prophets in these politicians who have job security for life and make a bunch of money and everyone else is suffering and life is harder and school's more expensive and houses are more expensive. Like how, where do we go from here and how did we get here? And so that's what goes back to like my, my point that I raised about financial literacy. We are in a country where you could have the greatest education. I went to good schools, good public schools, good private universities, and I never learned what money printing is or how it might adversely affect society, what the history of the Federal Reserve is, what, you know, what they actually do, how interest rates and all of that work. I did not learn that. And I should have like the fact that I didn't, it, that's a shame on our American education system. And we should ha be having these conversations, these dialogues, these discourses and debates about Keynesian economics versus Austrian, about capitalism, about, um, you know, uh, inflation versus, um, versus deflation. And we just don't have, we don't have those conversations. And so, you know, for me as a journalist, I just felt like I, I, I've now um, found or addressed a possible solution to the issues that I see ballooning in society. And I have to focus my attention on it. I really do because I don't want to live in a world where people are afraid to have children because they're going to be too expensive or they, you know, they get so frustrated that they have to work, you know, multiple jobs just to afford a house that their parents could have afforded really easily with one job, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I just don't think that's that's fair for the upper echelon of society to just collect more and more assets because it's so easy for them based on easy money and everybody else, again, like fighting for scraps. It's like, if anyone has watched game of Thrones, you know, it's like Cersei, you know, laughing in the red keep and everybody else is in flea bottom going, what the heck? Like, why, why are you in power? And we all just have to suffer. Um, you know, it's the road to serfdom that so many Bitcoiners quote. And I just think that life would be better for everyone involved at all levels. If there's a healthy amount of competition where it's based on value, where it's based on what you provide, but also fair access to that system, because it's not just rigged against you from the start. And I think right now, if you're poor, it's really hard to get out of that situation, despite the fact that we have capitalism in America. Well, we do. And we don't, I don't believe that capitalism is the money printer offering disproportionate access to money and capital to the people at the top and the big corporations that are too big to fail and always get bailed out by, by the, the, the government. That's not capitalism to me. That's rent seeking. That is a form of just, you know, money married to politics and we need to decouple them. And the only way I see that being possible is Bitcoin. So you wrote a tweet recently that dovetails into this perfectly. You said, 
The government response to the pandemic made the rich richer, the poor poorer, the dumb dumber, and the smart smarter. <laughs> yeah. Tell us what you meant by that. Yeah, well, so since the pandemic, I think, you know, we, that's like a, a delineation point, a, a marking of like, we're never going back to the world before. And we injected so much money into the system as a response that, you know, people were basically paid more to stay home than, than they were to actually produce economic value. Now we have all this money sloshing around in the system, most of which again, went to the, the top portions of society who, that bought up assets, real estate went through the roof, stocks went through the roof. Most people don't own assets. And so we like tipped the scales even further, made the situation, made the debt crisis even worse. And I think that, I think that all of these problems, you know, it shined a spotlight, you know, the poor are now poorer, the rich are now richer. I think that the people who, you know, are smart, they had the chance to be at home and learn more, consume more. I certainly spent so much time consuming as much literature and information that I could, not just about, you know, the news and what was happening, but just about Bitcoin and, and different, different things. And I think other people just became complacent and they said, whatever the government says is truth. And that's just it. And they don't question it. Um, so I, you know, I stand by that tweet because I really just believe that the last two years have been shocking to me when it comes to just the behavior I've seen of people, um, just, you know, the complacency, the, uh, the, also the thoughtfulness, the, the momentum to, to drive change and drive action, especially within Bitcoin and money. And, um, you know, it's been fascinating to see, and it's changed my career. The last two years made me go off on my own. <laughs> For sure. Well, I have to tell you, I love the tweet. Um, I'm not critical of it at all. In fact, I think <laughs> if anything, I'm jealous. I didn't come up with it myself. Uh, I, I think it was it was really brilliant. And I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, l- listen, I think there's a big part of our audience right now who are interested in Bitcoin because of the number go up technology. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of reasons to be involved in Bitcoin, which we talked about earlier. But um, people are worried right now. And they're they're afraid of investing, even if it's five or 10% of their net worth. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there struggling to just put meat on the table at night. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we watched the Bitcoin price go from 69,000 to 20,000 today, mm-hmm. your intellectual honesty and in saying, Hey, maybe we haven't hit a bottom just because of the, you know, the macro backdrop. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but how do you get these people from, hey, I'm fearful about, you know, just having some savings and being able to save for a bad event in my life or a rainy mm-hmm. day to saying, hey, I want to take that and put it into Bitcoin here at 20,000. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a, a price target? And I know, you know, you said price targets are all over the place and it's a very, very complex issue. What are the big guys behind the scenes saying in terms of their complex modeling, all the nuances between regulation, international concerns, um, market manipulation, you know, anything and everything that's on the table, how and how would you articulate to these people that now is the time to get involved, that at some point in time, it is going to be too late? And, and what do you think the upside ultimately is, aside from self-sovereign, you know, money and, and monetary system? Uh, Sure. So a couple of points on that. I mean, most of us in the Bitcoin space, especially those of us who have been in it a very long time and advocate for it online, we, um, we talk about dollar cost averaging, right? So again, you're not trying to really time the market. You'll sometimes swing higher or lower, but you just allocate a a certain percentage of, of your income or your savings to Bitcoin. And every single week you purchase at a different price. And at the end of the year, it sort of averages out to a certain a price point for Bitcoin. Um, right now, I think that that it is a great accumulation point. Though I I did mention earlier, I do think that we we have yet to see a bottom because there's so much in play. You mentioned, you know, we we are sort of on the brink of this liquidity crisis and and a, and a credit collapse. And ultimately, many of us have drawn the conclusion that the Fed will do what it always does. It will have to pivot and print. And Bitcoin has always been a big beneficiary of the printing. And at some point, you know, down the road, as this printing continues, as the Fed loses credibility, as the bubble bubble gets bigger and bigger, um, there's going to hopefully be a, a, a place at which Bitcoin is no longer correlated. It's no longer a correlated asset, but really people see the value of it being this decentralized, um, scarce, finite network, as opposed to everything else, which mo- most of which most of the things are not as uh, scarce or decentralized. So um, 
but back to my, uh, earlier point, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I just think that people should figure out, first of all, they have to acknowledge the fact that savings is really important. Even if you don't make a lot allocating something to your future, to savings, to a rainy, to the rainy day is really, really important. Now, that being said, if people are extraordinarily skeptical and I get it, some people are, they don't believe in Bitcoin or they see the short-term volatility 1%. I mean, I would say that there are things in my life that, you know, whether it's going out to eat or, or coffee or purchasing something that I could say, you know what, I'm going to forego that and just put 1% into Bitcoin and, and look at it as something that I won't touch. I won't look at, I won't stress about for at least four years. Um, I think no matter what your income range is, 1% is something that if you lost it, if you lost 1% of what you have, it's probably not going to hurt you that badly, but on the, but it has a huge upside. And if Bitcoin does take off and, it, and, you know, Bitcoin's been known to have rallies that could multiply, you know, what, what you have is all of a sudden 5X, 10X. And so why, you know, for me, that's not a risk. That's actually something that is probably, uh, you know, a pretty safe bet to make on something that when you zoom out has had this amazing logarithmic chart of performance and, and appreciation. So uh, I just think that people need to make some decisions, but but with the vantage point, with the kind of priority on saving, we are a nation of creditors and debtors, and we really need to return to accumulating capital, accumulating wealth. And I think that that strategy is going to help the people in the middle and at the bottom the most. And I get that they can't save as much, but they can still save. People can still save, even if they don't make as much as the person who's making six figures or, or you know, seven figures. And I just think that we need to, we need to shift that, um, we need to put a spotlight on, on the importance of saving again. And so I, you know, I advocate that Bitcoin is the best savings technology that's ever been inv invented. Cause again, decentralized, scarce, can't be confiscated, can't be controlled, can't be manipulated, can't be in, like all the things. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's it, kind of my, my take. It does. And, and how would you change your answer if it wasn't from the average Joe who's struggling to a multimillionaire who has, you know, a seven figure portfolio um, is it still that 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 10%? Or do you go much greater than that because of the asymmetric risk versus reward? And I know guys like Michael Saylor and some mm -hmm. of the others that, you know, you communicate with on a very regular basis, they're very, very deep into it. Is that the right place? Is that the right number to be all in everything? Mm -hmm. Or is it somewhere in between one and all in? Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone obviously has a different risk tolerance. I found it really fascinating and inspiring. The fact that we're hearing more billionaires that have allocated some of them 60% of their wealth into Bitcoin. Some of them have come out publicly and said that that is, that's a huge statement in my opinion. And I know that there are a lot of really big names out there, prominent names that have not come public, but own Bitcoin. And I have allocated um, significant percentages to Bitcoin. So um, you know, I kind of think of uh, something that Anthony Scaramucci, who was a guest on my show, and he's a big Bitcoin bull, has said he started with a smaller allocation. I think it was 1% or 5%. And because of its appreciation, it grew to 20%, you know? And so that's what Bitcoin naturally does. And so I think it just depends. But people who have a lot of money should really look at what they're investing in, the performance, what their time horizon is, and the fact that it's you can't you can't save in cash. The cash is just being demolished when it comes to purchasing power. And so do you want to sit there and, you know, trust that the companies and equities that you're investing in are going to have uh, the kind of, you know, um, appreciation that beats inflation at this level that Bitcoin would, because Bitcoin's pri price performance, especially before the pandemic, is far more than any of the other asset classes you could have allocated to. Like Bitcoin's up, I think, 100 percent since the the since the before the covid crash, whereas gold is up, I think, like. I don't know, 15% uh, oils up 70% S and P's up uh, in the teens or th maybe 30%. I mean, Bitcoin's beat every single other asset class. So again, if I were very, very wealthy, I would want to protect my money. And I would look at Bitcoin as something that's actually probably one of the best ways uh, to protect my purchasing power, especially if my time horizon is five, 10 years and beyond. I love it. Um, so Natalie, we are running short on time. I promised you that I would be very, very respectful of your time. Um, I have one question that I want to give you the last word. Um, you know, Bitcoin is so beautiful because it doesn't care about age. It doesn't care about gender. It doesn't care about, um, you know, race. It doesn't care about anything. And you are a 
incredible ambassador to women in Bitcoin. And my wife, believe it or not, has actually gotten really interested in Bitcoin. And she bought a book and started reading about it. And she loves to hear me talk about it. What would you say to women who are, you know, maybe interested, maybe not interested? And how can we get a more diverse set of people, and especially women included, involved in Bitcoin and involved in the conversation and involved in orange pilling, you know, the rest of society? Yeah. Well, hello to your wife. Uh, what book <laughs> did you. she get, by the way? Um, you know what? It's on her nightstand. So I haven't read okay. it. She literally um, got it about three weeks ago and she's been going through it very slowly. And I'm just letting her do her thing and I'm letting her come into it at her pace and I'm not putting too much pressure on her. I love it. I love it. Well, first of all, I'm very proud to be a woman in Bitcoin, especially given the fact that there aren't as many women as I'd love to see. It's definitely not a 50-50 split. Um, and, and, you know, in the beginning, I used to wonder about that because Bitcoin is a technology network. And so, you know, when you look at sort of the areas of intersection within Bitcoin, which are engineering, computer science, technology, finance, gaming, all of these things are very male dominated and male driven. So maybe it's not such a surprise that Bitcoin is, is very male dominated, but this is a financial revolution. And so I'm very passionate about the idea of women having a seat at that table and being a part of the revolution so that they aren't left behind and they get a big slice of the pie. Um, this really allows the allows for financial inclusion for the bank, unbanked to be banked. I've heard many inspiring stories of women around the world, especially in developing nations who have been able to gain sovereignty and independence and, uh, and accumulate savings and capital through Bitcoin. And I find that to be so incredible and inspiring. And I just, I hope to bring more women in. I think women are very um, community driven. We love people. We love talking and engaging. And that's so important for this message to spread. And it, the message needs to be simplified. You know, some of this is very techy and geeky, and I hope I'm doing my part in simplifying the message and helping make it a more welcoming space um, because we need both. We need everybody. Like you mentioned, Bitcoin has no race, no gender, no age. Uh, and, and that's, what's beautiful about it. Everyone can benefit from it. If everybody, if everybody adopts Bitcoin, everybody, you know, benefits. And so we want to get everybody on the Bitcoin standard and this sort of life raft from a parallel system that isn't fair and is so broken and at so many levels. So I hope to see more women. If there's anything I can do to encourage them, you know, I'd love to be a part of that and, uh, and very grateful that so many women have, you know, allowed me to bring them into the space. Well, that's tremendous. And thank you for the service that you have done, not just women, but to the entire Bitcoin community. Thank um, you. Natalie, how can people get in touch with you and just stay active with what you're doing, your podcast, your Twitter? Is there anywhere else that yeah. people can find you? Tell us what you're up to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. People can follow me on Twitter at Nat Brunel. I also host a show on the Bitcoin magazine YouTube page called hard money. So that's at hard money show. Um, my podcast is called coin stories on every podcast platform and on YouTube. And if you want to learn more about other things I do, you can head to talkingbitcoin.com. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, listen, Natalie, thank you so much for coming. As always, uh, thank you for watching the Savant Report podcast. If you like the content, please make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel. Natalie, thank you. I hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. Thanks for watching and listening to the Savant Report. We love interacting with our base. And so if you have questions or comments, we encourage you to leave them below. Don't forget to find us on Twitter, at Jordan Weirs and at Savant Report, and drop me a direct message. I'm always eager to engage with our listeners and our audience and discuss important topics about investing.